Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Let's turn to God in prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for who you are, Lord God. We thank you for blessing us to be here at this moment, at this time, Lord God. We know it's not by accident or by chance, but by your active divine will that we're here today, Lord God. And so we know that you have something for us. We haven't gathered to hear a man, but to hear directly from you. Amen. So I pray that I may decrease so that Jesus, you in me can increase. Yes. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We're continuing our focus. We're getting towards the end of our focus on the spiritual disciplines. Mm. We're going to take on prayer over the next couple weeks. And as I shared with you last week, I'm going to have to get on my horse because I painted myself into a corner. I thought that fasting would be the last one and then I'd wrap it all up. But then God reminded me, no, you haven't dealt with prayer. I thought I'd, there was a video of it and there is not. And so we're going to do a, a series on prayer. We're going to wrap this all up by Christmas. Not going to pray for me, church. <laughs> all right. And you know we do interaction, so you can't be going all along because I can't squeeze another week in here. Right, folks. So let's just let's just keep it focused. Let's just keep it moving. All right. We're going to talk about prayer today, and the the this moment is incredibly ironic because I think I've shared with you before. Growing up, I did not like church. Remember me saying that? Yeah. And it's funny that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but the thing that I liked the least in church were sermons about prayer and the other spiritual disciplines. Because I always felt guilty. I always thought I was doing it wrong. And the truth is, church, it, not until recently have I felt really successful in prayer. Actually successful, like I enjoy it and I'm getting something out of it and I, and I get it and I get why I'm doing it. And, and I'm serving in, in ministry and, and I'm leading young people, and I'm doing all these things, and struggling with prayer. Struggling with it. Preaching sermons on it. But don't have a prayer life that I enjoy. Remember what I told you about enjoying Christ? Yeah. All right, that's the key question. We need to ask ourselves, are we enjoying Christ? Because if we're not enjoying it, we're doing something wrong. Because our Lord is refreshing and sweet and wonderful and beautiful. He can't be anything else. You understand what I'm saying, church? So if we're experiencing something in our spiritual life that is, is distasteful, burdensome, that feels shameful, we ain't doing it right, church. We ain't doing it right. And I'm here to confess to you, for most of my walk with Christ, I have been doing prayer right. And I know you're all fire baptized, <laughs> spirit filled, Holy Ghost filled, first word hallelujah Christians, right? So I know you all never struggled with prayer. Right? So please indulge me as I talk about this. But honestly speaking, if that's my testimony, I guarantee many of you are in the same place. Amen? amen. Don't make me feel like I'm going to be here alone. I said amen, church. Amen. amen. So we're going to talk about prayer today and next week. This time we're going to focus on the purpose of the spiritual discipline, discipline of prayer. I think one of the reasons why we get stuck is because we just get so in the habit of doing church. And when you become a, a Christian, one of the things that you do is you're supposed to pray. Why? Why do we pray? What's the point? Right? We, and and that's, that's exactly right, brother. Right? We, we say that is communication with God. But do I communicate with my wife like I communicate with my professor? Do I communicate with my children like I communicate with my dog? Well, sometimes, anyway. Like I communicate <laughs> with, a communicate with a purpose. It's a really sweet dog, church. I mean, rabbit is so sweet. 
Um, do I communicate with my children the way I communicate with a perfect stranger? No, right? Why is that? There's a different purpose to the communication. Do you understand, church? So yeah, we understand the fact that we pray because it's communication with God, but what is the point of that communication? That's where I got hung up. Because there's so many times I just got on my knees and I was talking and I just felt like my words are bouncing off the ceiling. I don't know what I'm supposed to say. I'm not sure if I'm saying it right. I don't know if he's hearing me. I don't know if I'm doing more harm than good. Is that just me? Right? So it's not enough that we understand that it's communicating with God. But what kind of communication? What's the point? Where are we supposed to go? Of course, you know where we're going to start, right, church? We're going to start with Jesus. See, no. Okay. <laughs> the clicker's against me, church. I don't need you, someone to rebuke the clicker in the name of Jesus. Put some oils on that. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13, his disciples came to him with the same dilemma that I'm outlining now. Lord, teach us to pray because they saw Jesus pray and they saw something in the quality of his prayer that was different than everyone else's. Mm. So it's not that they've never been exposed to prayer before. They never were exposed to prayer like that. So intimate and personal and powerful. Mm. And they said, how do we pray like that? Church, how do I pray like that? See, I know I know what prayer is. I can talk to God, but how do I pray with intimacy and power? And so he broke it down for me. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. You can say along with me if you want. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. It's one of the most popular spots in the Bible. And we can often take for granted the power of this prayer. So we're going to go through it a little bit and pick it apart. Because in it is where we find the purpose of prayer. Again, that's what we're going to cover in this sermon. We're going to talk about the purpose of prayer. Next time, we're going to talk practically about how you do it. And church, you know that whole praying without ceasing thing? We're going to talk about how to do it. We're going to set some folks free in this series. Glory to God. Amen? Amen. You're going to revolutionize your prayer life, church. All right? We're going to have a bunch of prayer warriors. I'm going to come in here the next time, and there's going to be a pile of money over here. <laughs> and a pile of people over here that just say, we don't know where to sit. You know, we just want to work for Jesus and, and in the name of God, amen? That's what's going to happen when we start to pray. Don't forget about that pile of money part, church. Pile of money right over there. All right. Jesus begins with two of the most beautiful words in all scripture. Our Father. What comes to your mind when you hear the words, our Father? Relationship. Mm -hmm. Amen. What else do you hear? Inclusion. Inclusion. Yes. Yes. What else? Belonging. The same Belonging. Belonging. Yeah. Right? What else? Honor. Honor. Yes. Yes. In these two simple words, Jesus is defining our relationship with God and with each other and with him. In those two simple words. And it's a relationship of love, honor, and respect. He does it just by saying, our Father. Mm. And the fact that Jesus is saying it makes us included in something so much bigger and better than you can possibly imagine. Because that relationship between the Father and the Son pre -pre predicated everything. And it came before everything. It pre-existed. That's the word. Pre-existed. <laughs> Before creation. 
There has never been a time when Jesus wasn't the Son and the Father wasn't the Father. Do you understand that, church? And so we are being included in something that is timeless and gave birth to all that there is. Our Father. Now I'm going to try to get, I'm going to try to do it justice, right? I, that's just a touch of the power of this prayer. There are whole books, many books written on the Lord's Prayer. And I would suggest that you check one out at some point. I can give you some suggestions. But there's so much here. So we're just going to try to scratch, scratch the surface. But it all begins with those two words, our Father. So we start with communion, inclusion, fellowship. And then where do we go? Then we talk about the king and the kingdom, church. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. This gets us to immediately stop focusing on our own agenda and focus on God's agenda. Let your will be done. It's one of the most powerful prayers a Christian could pray. When Jesus was facing death and praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, he poured out his heart to his father, and he didn't want to die. He didn't want to suffer. He didn't want to feel the pain and, and the, the emotional and physical pain that he was about to endure. And he poured his heart out to the father and said, please take this cup from me, but nevertheless not my will, but let yours be done. And sometimes we don't even know what to pray. And the best prayer that you can pray is, Lord, let your will be done. See, i got to give another sermon on being open in prayer. The, the, the posture of prayer is one of openness to what the Father wants to do. And if we are open in prayer, then that translates to a life of openness to whatever God wants to do. Lord, this is what I want to have happen, but nevertheless... Let your will be done. This is what I think is best. This is the job I think I want. But nevertheless, Lord, let your will be done because I want to lift up the king and the kingdom. Glory to the living God. And whatever you choose, Lord, I'm good with that because I know you only know how to do good things. If your will is not to give me what I ask for, glory to your name. I trust you. If I think the way that I'm supposed to go is different, forget about me. It's all about you. Glory to the living God. And just so we're clear, when I talk about kingdom, when the Bible talks about kingdom, we're talking about God's presence, God's rule, and where God's people live God's way. And what Jesus says is that the kingdom of God is at hand because when he hit the scene, the kingdom started because he no longer lives in a temple made with hands, but he makes his very home in the hearts of his people. So we carry the kingdom wherever we go. Now, whether or not we choose to spread it, that's, that's a different issue. And then we can move on to provision. Give us today our daily bread. God is our source. God is the one who provides all things. Does God know how to give good gifts to his children? Absolutely. So if you, ha if you have something, he gave it to you, yes? Yes. And so then if you don't have something, he made a conscious decision not to give it to you, yes? Mm -hmm. So what you have is what you need, yes? Yes. So we need to stop yelling at God for all the stuff that we think that we need that we don't have. Because he's a good God who knows how to give good gifts. And so you have what you need. Now there's some things that I want and I'm talking to him about. But I have to approach him from the perspective that, Lord, I have what I need. Far too often we approach God like he's Santa. Mm -hmm. We come in with him with our list. We get bent out of shape when he doesn't give us what we want. But usually he doesn't give it because it's not good for us. It causes us to have a distorted image of him and ourselves. 
It's not good. You gotta trust him. And lastly, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors, as we also forgive our debtors. So this whole prayer in some ways hinges on that line. It starts out with our Father. That means my relationship with God is not just one dimensional, me and God, but there's something that goes me and God, but then this way too to my brothers and sisters, yes? And we're all gonna be trying to seek God together, but do we always get it right? Am I gonna step on your toes sometimes? Am I gonna hurt your feelings sometimes? Am I gonna not show up when I should show up sometimes? So if you don't forgive me, and you put me in a prison, emotionally, then that's going to impede your relationship with God. Mm -hmm. Because as broken and as flawed as I am, I'm his kid. I am. I'm his kid. And he loves me. So in order for Christian community to work, we have to pray that prayer. And we don't pray it enough. We don't pray it enough. We're very judgmental. And we need to be more like our God. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. This is sometimes hard to understand, but what this prayer is praying is don't tempt us beyond what we can bear. Lord, just be merciful upon us. Because you're our only hope to overcome evil. Because we can't overcome evil with evil. And in my flesh, guess what I am? I'm, I'm the sum of all fears, man. I'm evil. But in Christ, I am the righteousness of God. Amen? Amen. So that's what I'm pleading. That's what I'm leaning on. And so you can summarize this piece. I'm summarizing it as holiness. And holiness is having our actions line up with our being. God has a purpose and destiny for you. He's made you special. Holiness is being that in Christ. Very simple. And so we're, the prayer is asking us for asking God's help to help us be that. And one thing that holds this all together is that when we pray, pray properly, we are participating in Christ's prayer life. He and the Holy Spirit perfect our prayer. We often put pressure on ourselves. And I've heard people say, and it's just heartbreaking, I don't pray right. That is underestimating who God is, church. If you understand the dynamics behind prayer, you would never say that. Because it starts out by saying, our Father. And Jesus is teaching us how to pray. So Jesus is taking some responsibility in this. There's some skin in the game for him. And what is brought out in the book of Romans is that the Holy Spirit, he takes our prayers and he says, hmm, okay, well, you know what? You really didn't need that, so let me lop that off. <laughs> Here's what you really meant, so let me add some of that in there. You know, let me just shine the whole thing up. Let me just shine up this prayer. Uh, beautiful, perfect, right? And then what he does is he hands it over to Jesus, right? And Jesus has already been praying because if we're connected to God, what the Holy Spirit tells you to pray is what Jesus is praying. Do you understand that, church? We participate in his vicarious life and relationship with the Father. And he is always interceding at the right hand of God on your behalf. So the prayer that you prayed did not originate with you. It originated with Jesus. The Holy Spirit comes and says, this is what Jesus is praying. That's what we pray. He takes our imperfect prayer, polishes up, hands it to Jesus, and he says, awesome, awesome. I'm going to put this with my prayer, and I'm going to offer this up to the Father. So when you pray, you are praying in Christ, so it's impossible to pray imperfectly. Every prayer is perfect. Offered up to God. Now, this is when we start from a place of listening. Amen, church? Where it's not our agenda, but we're seeking to put forward God's agenda. Do you understand how that works? 
But understand that in prayer, you are not doing it on your own. It, you're not doing it in a way that God will look disfavorably on you. We're doing it in Christ. Amen? Amen? Amen. You're not excited enough. I find, that to be, <laughs> I find that to be liberating. I find that to be really, really good news, church. Because I don't know about you, but there's some things that I look in the world and I just don't know <coughs> what to say. I don't even know what to say, church. But the Holy Spirit, again, we were told in Romans that the, under, the, the Holy Spirit understands those groanings of my heart, things that I can't even articulate, and he prays those things on my behalf. I don't even have to worry about it. He's got it. He's got it. He's got you in prayer. Amen? Amen. So we can summarize the purposes of prayer this way. To help facilitate a refreshing life of communion with God. This is a great way. Prayer is the way we develop our friendship with God. Where we walk with him and talk with him and call him friend. To help us focus on the king and the kingdom. Prayer is one of the places where we fight the battlefield for our minds. The battlefield for our minds. Those two warring entities. One that wants to, I guess it's three. Because there's one that wants to follow God. One that wants to follow ourselves. And then there's one that chooses between the two. And prayer is where we work it out. And in, in prayer is where we can begin to defeat the part of us that wants to be focused on ourselves. Yeah. To realize God's provision, we need to, like I said, we need to start from a place of God being our provider, mm -hmm. and he gives us what we need. Mm -hmm. and, and that's called contentment, church. Mm -hmm. That's a really good word that we don't talk about enough. Mm -hmm. Being content, our society doesn't know what contentment is oh. at all. Everything you need more, bigger, better, you know, faster. Right? If you don't like the size of your lips, get bigger ones. Mm -hmm. If you don't like your car, get a better one. If you don't like your phone, there's a new one coming out that makes pancakes for you and, and balances your checkbook. I mean, Can I get that? <laughs> and I feel bad. Mike's not here. Mike, you can hear this. I did. Mike's got a flip phone, like the first flip phone. And, and so does Brother Steven. I, I love them both. And there's a part of me that was like, one day, I'm going to switch that phone out for a real phone. And I'm going to donate it to the Smithsonian. <laughs> but where does that come from? That's not from the word. That's me adopting our society's viewpoint of never being content. Unless you got the latest phone. My phone is fantastic. It does amazing things. But what I saw the eight I thought eight of them. Well, it's not that great. You know? It's not quite as fast as I would like. Prayer is where you get some of that junk taken out of your mind. And then where you realize that you already have what you need. Glory to God. And lastly, to empower us to live as we should. As we pray, God often lets his will for our spiritual growth be known. Identity comes from relationship, and it's prayer where we revel and, and operate and employ that relationship as the conduit that God uses to tell you who you are. This is who you are. This is the will that I have for you. And as we listen, as we do the things that God tells us to do, we start to realize for ourselves who we were made to be. What is your purpose and destiny in Christ? The last part I want to leave you with, actually this is uh, the next to last part, but another really important thing that we need to understand. I'm not exactly how, sh how I'm not like exactly sure how this works. But prayer changes the world. Changes changes the world. 
pray for it to change my tongue because I lost the ability to speak momentarily there, but I'm back. Prayer changes the world. I'm not sure how, but we have the testimony in the Old Testament and the New Testament to show that it does. How does that work with a, a God who's outside of space and time, who created time? I don't really know. Yeah. Above my pay grade. <laughs> but I know that it does work. And one of the reasons why I know it works is because Jesus prayed. If anyone didn't need to pray, mm -hmm. it would be Jesus. But Jesus prayed. Do you understand, church? Mm -hmm. And we have prayers that Jesus prayed that God said no to. There's a better way, including the prayer I just mentioned in the Garden of Gethsemane. He did not want to die. God said, you're going to have to die. Mm -hmm. As much as it breaks my heart. As much as it suffers, it makes me suffer, I'm suffering with you. This is how things must be. And there are other times where Jesus prayed and, and the storm stopped. So I don't know how that works. <laughs> but I know it does. Prayer is a change agent. So not only does it change the world, and I think we kind of hopefully believe that if we're sitting in this room. <laughs> but the real, real kicker here is that the purpose of prayer is to change you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To pray is to change. And by praying, you are saying, God, I want to change. I want to be like Clyde was saying. I want to be like Jesus. You see, far too often we think prayer is our time to have an audience with the king. We go in and we plead our case and we <laughs> make our needs known and we expect God to address those things in a timely fashion <laughs> and in the way that we've outlined. <laughs> but that's not what prayer is. It's okay to bring a list to God, but the purpose of bringing a list to God is to say, God, are these the right things for me to want? Mm -hmm. Does this conform to what your purpose and destiny for me is? Do you understand what I'm saying, church? Mm -hmm. You go into, to God in prayer to change. And I know all of you are fantastic, right? But as wonderful as you are, you need to change. And I know what you're thinking. Not you, Pastor. Yes. <laughs> Even me. I need to change. Amen? Amen. amen. You said amen a little too loud on that one. <laughs> this is also how we get free of the burden of carrying resentment towards God for unanswered prayers. For years, as a child, I prayed for my father to be returned to my family. I grew up without a dad. From the time I was five years old, I didn't know where he was. Still don't. I don't know whether or not my father's alive or dead. Five years old was the last time I saw him. And from that point on, I prayed for years <coughs> for God to restore my family because it's different than it is now. It just wasn't that cool to grow up without a dad where I was. Mm -hmm. I was made fun of, um, both folks inside and outside the church. Mm -hmm. I was looked down upon. Mm -hmm. I was discounted. Mm -hmm. And it was painful. And they weren't cool about it either. On Father's Day, it was the worst day for me. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't make any allowances for me. I would have to go on with it just like everybody else and pretend like I'm making a card for someone that actually is in my life. And I begged God, and I pleaded. And, you know, when I was around 18 or so, I broke with God. And that was part of it, man. I was, I was like, you know, I've been praying for years. Like, I didn't ask for much, but why do I have to be that kid? The kid that grew up in a cult without a dad. Why do I have to be weird and alone? Why do I have to be that kid? Like, everyone's got problems, but why do I have to have all those problems? 
And I've been praying to you and I've been talking to you, God, and I just feel like you're just really not even there. So why don't you do you, I'll do me, and we'll see how that goes. So much anger, so much resentment. Someone needs to be teaching our children how to pray. Because they do, they pray. And they want to know that someone's there. So what do we do with that? We have to understand what prayer is. I didn't really understand what it was for and what it was about. But you know the amazing thing is even though I thought it wasn't working, it was. Do you understand, church? I was changing and didn't even realize it. And I, and I, I saw the moment when I was a youth pastor standing in front of about 30 kids. I've told this story before, but here we go again. And God moved me to ask them, how many of you have a father, a man that loves you living with, in your house? And about 20, 30 kids are there, and only three kids raise their hand. And I swear to you, this is what happened. I, I'm not exaggerating, but it was like, you know when people say your life flashed before your eyes? My whole childhood flashed before my eyes in that moment. And I saw all those cards that I wrote to my father who wasn't in my life. And I saw all those times where I was made fun of and discounted and Dis, uh, just dismissed because I didn't have a father in my life. And I realized that during that time, I was being prepared and equipped to set these young people free, to let them know that there's a God who loves them, who's always been there. He rewrote my past. Do you understand that, church? We serve a timeless God. He rewrote my past and understanding of it. And then I saw him crying with me in all those prayers. I saw him in those quiet times when I thought I was alone. Mm -hmm. That's the God we serve, church. Amen. Amen. That's the God we serve. And that's why we have to understand what prayer is for. But he's a faithful God. Even when we do it wrong, he makes it right. Mm -hmm. He makes it right. Mm -hmm. The last thing I want to leave you with is this has been a theme of our discussion about the spiritual disciplines, that we cannot try to do them. It's not about trying, it's about training, it's about practice, it's about turning our hearts and our eyes towards God because we are naturally disposed to turn away from Him. And something that Dallas Willard writes in Divine Conspiracy, um, you know what, you probably could see it better than me. Will someone read that for me? Go ahead, thank you, sister. Prayer simply dies from efforts to pray about good things that honestly do not matter to us. The way to get to meaningful prayer for those good things is to start by praying for what we are truly interested in. The circles of our interests like ne will inevitably grow in the largeness of God's love. Many people have found prayer impossible because they thought they should only pray for wonderful but remote needs they actually had little or no interest in or knowledge of. Mm. Amen. Amen. So another thing I was taught, taught wrong, in prayer I need to get my mind off myself. And I need to start praying for global missions and the state of Christians and for people to come to Christ. To, because to, to pray for myself is selfish. Then I read, I think, John um, 17. I think it's that. Um, it's either 16 or 17, but in there. Jesus' longest recorded prayer in scripture. And don't you know he started by praying for himself? <laughs> he started by praying for himself. I was like, wait a second now. <laughs> wait a second now. Are you, saying, are you telling me Jesus is selfish? I don't think you're telling me that. <laughs> the opposite is true. When we start, when we're trying to get into pray, pray for the things that are immediately on your mind. Pray for you. It, it, I got hung up because I thought there were some things I was supposed to pray for, and I put a lot of pressure on myself, and when those things didn't immediately come to mind, I felt guilty. I was like, oh, I'm such a terrible person. I'm thinking only about myself, and and then this spiral, and I don't, don't want to pray because I feel like I'm not very good at it, and on and on we go. No, start with yourself. Start local. Start with the things immediately on your mind. Right? And, and don't feel like prayer needs to be a certain way. I think a lot of times we approach prayer like an actor 
approaches a role, where we're getting on stage and we're performing and we're reciting some kind of monologue, and we have to watch her about the quality of it and, and how it's done. And no, 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 we need to pray what's on our heart. The man who's after God's own heart had the most rough prayers in all the scripture. David, the Psalms are rough. You don't believe me? Read Psalms 13, 1 through 4. Right? He cried out to God. He wrestled with him. But he always ended in a place of faithful submission to God. He was changed by prayer. Do you understand that, church? And what the Psalms are, are a, a musical version of his process in prayer. That's why he's a man after God's own heart. He allowed prayer to change him. Amen? But it starts with not being cute. By being messy. There's a whole book of messy prayers, lamentations. Mm. Crying out to God, where were you? Where are you? Why do I feel alone? Are you keeping your promises? Are you going to show up, God? And the times when, I'm finally, when I finally break down and pray those prayers are the times when God's like, finally, we can get something started here. We're ready to be honest and we can talk now. So it doesn't have to be cute and pretty and nice or you use fancy words, SAT words, none of that. <laughs> Pray your heart. Pray what's on your mind. And one of the best ways to pray is to ask God to teach you. Remember, that's how Jesus started the conversation and he started teaching us about prayer to begin with. His disciples were humble enough and were willing to listen to God enough to say, Lord, teach me how to pray. And if you struggle with prayer, and if your prayer life is burdensome, and you're not experiencing those periods of refreshment from prayer, let that be your prayer. Lord, teach me to pray. Lord, teach me to pray. What it is, prayer is, and another way to look at prayer is a classroom where we're taught how to communicate with a divine supreme being. See, God's not just gonna take us into eternity and leave us ill-equipped and unprepared. We're practicing now to have conversations and communion and intimacy with a supernatural, perfect, divine being. And of course we don't know how to do that right. Of course we need practice. So why, don't, why not get started now practicing in prayer? Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much that we can cast all of our burdens upon you. Yeah. Lord, you have an answer to all life's questions and all of our dilemmas, Lord God. Even things that we think we should know, like how to pray. Help us not to take those things for granted and to turn to you and ask you to teach us. Show us how to pray, Lord God. I pray that this church be a church that prays intimately and powerfully in you, Lord God. I want to see my brothers and sisters have such a rich prayer life, Lord, that it runs over. That sometimes we just scrap everything we're doing just to talk to you, Lord God, because we hear you and feel you talking to us. Let it be so in this place, Lord God. And not just here, but in our prayer closets too, alone at home. Bless us to have vibrant, dynamic prayer lives, Lord. And as we do that, we know that we will change. We'll become more like Jesus. And that's what we want, Lord. We thank you. We give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.